Welcome to your Coast Trek journey. You're about to take on a life-changing adventure with your team. We're really excited that you're here with us and we're here to deliver to you our top tips so that you get the best out of your training journey and that you have the most fun on event day. We've gathered together a host of experts in different areas to give you their top tips on foot care, nutrition, injury prevention, training and fundraising. Of course along the way you'll make friends, you'll have fun and you'll be fundraising for Fred, the Fred Hollows Foundation. Your life will change and while you do that you'll be raising funds to change the life of many other people around the world by restoring sight. So congratulations on taking on this journey. We love that you're a part of our team and we look forward to showing you the best possible way to get ready for your coast trek. taken on Coast Trek as a team challenge. Doing something on your own is often easier, but as a team you need to think about each other. My top tips to you as a team player are, always be aware of your teammates and how they're going. Put the slowest person at the front and alternate who's leading and who's at the back so no one person is at the back for too long. Take your toilet stops together. You'll save a lot of time and energy. Make sure you understand each other's goals. For some people, their goal may be just to get to the finish. And for others, they may have a specific time goal in mind. As a team, you guys need to come up with what works best for you. Some of the Coast Trek route might involve some soft sand sections. Don't panic, there's nothing to worry about. Just do some in your training and take on our top tips. My advice to you is that when you're training on soft sand, you're working to get your heart rate up and to build strength in your feet and your legs. Vary your pace and try the difference between a run, a soft sand shuffle or a walk. On event day, your goal is to preserve your energy and stay injury free. So I would recommend slowing down and doing the soft sand shuffle to take the pressure off your hip flexors. When you take on the soft sand shuffle, try and get your toes really deep into the sand, toe first, as if you're a ballerina. You can either take your shoes off and give your feet a break, or keep your shoes on and then put on some cuffs or gaiters, which will help to keep some of the sand out of your shoes. Take on some of the soft sand challenges that we've thrown into our 12-week training program to really work out how to train best on that surface. Wild Women on Top are the experts in trek training for adventure. We've put together for you a program which we've given to many of our clients over the years. It's a combination of trek training, high intensity interval training and some fun recovery sessions. We'll deliver this to you over a 12 week period. You'll be doing some training on soft sand, bush tracks, trails, hills, and then using your own program or routine to throw in some high intensity interval sessions. One of my top tips for teams that take on Coast Trek is focus on the things that you can control and forget about those you can't. One of people's many fears are that it's going to be very hot. If it's hot on the day, or indeed if it's hot during training, take some of our top tips from our training guide. Some of those are to carry a bandana and keep it wet, hang it around your neck. It really does help to cool you down. I love to carry some icy poles too if I'm going out on a big team training session. Most importantly, be willing to change your training session if a hot day is expected. Stay near the water, get wet as often as you can, wear light clothing, not black like repents, and make sure you keep an eye on your team members for any signs of heat stress. One of the exciting parts of taking on a challenge in nature 
is that you're going to be exposed to many different elements. My top tip to you and your team is to train in all weather, besides lightning storms and extreme heat. But for example, on a rainy day, don't cancel your training session. It's a perfect opportunity to try out your training gear and to see what it's like to walk for a long distance over many hours in the rain and wet. Make sure you take a spare pair of socks, have a good waterproof rain jacket and some spare clothing in your pack to change if you need to. For some of you, you may be walking at night or if it's just a cold day, I highly recommend packing some merino layers. Some of my favorite brands are Icebreaker. They, they dry quickly and they keep you warm if you layer them up. Most importantly, a windproof or rainproof jacket that you've actually tested out in the rain is one of the best pieces of gear you can carry with you. The temperature can drop significantly from the daytime to the nighttime, and I highly recommend that you go prepared for any weather. An important part of your training program will be your long distance walks. These are often the bits that we find the most fun. But I must warn you, don't take on too many, one after the other, and load up many junk miles, because you can be prone to injury. In our program, we show you how to build up the distance over several weeks, and use the long walks to practice the route if you can, or use it to try out your gear, your hydration, your nutrition, and your team tactics. Trek training is team training in nature. We love to go explore the bush trails, coastal tracks, stairways and hills and use our body weight and sometimes add weight to our pack to get a full-on workout. It's not just your physical being that will benefit from trek training, it's your mental being too. It helps build mental toughness as you take on some of the high intensity intervals or stair repetitions. It's also a great way to challenge yourself in many different ways, using a pack, poles, body weight exercises, and lots of different surfaces out in nature. Look, it's absolutely essential that everything you're planning to do on event day, you've practiced in your training. So that includes every nutrition strategy and your hydration strategies. It's one of the key mistakes that I've seen so, so many times. Um, and one of those things are if people are used to following a low carb diet or they're used to following you know, a very healthy diet, which I hope most of the trekkers are, on the lead up and then suddenly on event day they think, oh, I'm going to need lollies and jelly snakes and glucose gels and suddenly they've got this influx of carbohydrate. Their, their gut is not accustomed to having so much carbohydrate in there and especially so many sugary foods. And you can just end up feeling nauseous, you can even start being sick, um, and it really isn't going to, to help you on that day. So you've got to know what your gut can handle, and you can actually train, this is what athletes do, they train their gut to be able to absorb and take on board the amount of carbohydrate that you need to do a long-term endurance event. And that's what you really need to be practicing. One of my real top tips though is to make sure that you mix up the amount of different types of carbohydrate foods you're going to use. So don't just rely on those sugary sweet kind of foods. You want to mix up the savoury with the sweet. So if you've practiced those things in training, you're going to know what really works for you. The other thing that's good to do in training is to try to get an idea about how much you're going to drink and what you need to be doing to stay hydrated. And if you can practice those on a hot day and on a cooler day, it will also help you to understand how that's really going to vary. So my first ever coast track was the 100K and we'd practice lots of hydration therapies. I had lots of hydrolytes and so on with me. And then event day was, was lots of rain. It was, was actually quite chilly at times. And it was a totally different hydration strategy to, to what it might have been if it had been a really, really hot day. <laughs> Chicken noodle soup, which was very good in the rain last year. Going on. But the egg and bacon rolls are really nice. Yeah. Some special shop in Collaroy. 
Well, the week before Coast Trek, you know, in the old days, everyone thought about carb loading. So you certainly want your body's glycogen stores, that's your body's carbohydrate stores, to be full when you start event day so that you've got as much fuel on board. So remember that your body is always burning a mixture of fat and carbohydrate. So you want the glycogen stores to be full because that's your limiting factor. Even if you're very lean, you've got plenty of fat on board, it's carbohydrate that's going to be restricted. So the goal of the week before is to make sure, come event day morning, your glycogen stores are full. But what you don't want to do is have tailored your training and be eating a whole load of extra fuel so that you actually gain a little bit of weight beforehand. That, that you want to be as light as you possibly can, of course, on the day so that you're feeling really, really good. So what you'll find is that all you need to do is keep eating the way that you've been eating, make sure that you're including, and my Dr. Joanna plate is a good model to follow because then you include a good, what I call a smart carb in every meal. If you do that and you tailor your training at the same time, then you're going to find your glycogen stores are nicely full on event day morning and you feel super fit and ready to go. Um, so what I suggest is having a really nice, slow release carbohydrate breakfast. So on the first year I did Coast Trek, we made a beautiful big birch or muesli in the morning. So we'd soak some oats and dried fruit overnight. We added some nuts and seeds, some natural yogurt in the morning. We all had a big bowl of that to start off. A bowl of porridge would be great, some muesli, you know, toast. Really think about something that's a nice, slow release carb that's going to just fuel those first few hours. Then for snacks that you take with you, you've got to think about one, what's going to be good to take and carry, um, and you want a mixture of sweet and savoury. My other warning factor is that I can promise you a lot of you are not going to feel like eating. So when you're walking and you're exercising for such a long period of time, your body's metabolism adjusts and it wants to adjust to help you with exercise. So it actually ramps back your appetite and it won't be cueing you to eat. So a mistake is to think, oh well, if I'm not hungry, I shouldn't eat, which would be my normal advice. But during the event, you've actually got to force yourself. We even had, you know, one of our teams as a timekeeper saying you know on the hour making sure that everyone had had at least something to eat every hour so sandwiches crackers um, watch against dry foods just because you, your mouth might be quite dry and it can be hard to swallow so think about putting some moisture either on either onto those crackers or into the sandwich the other big suggestion that I have is have a support crew who meet you at one or two points and bring you some fresh food. So we had a support crew meet us in the morning with a beautiful big fruit salad with some yogurt and that was just so refreshing and lovely to have something nice and cold and fresh. On the year that it was, it was pouring with rain, we actually had our support crew meet us with a big pot of chicken and barley soup and some white bread rolls and, and that was just fantastic. And this, that was the 100k, so at the 60k mark when we were all dying in our last legs, actually that meal really picked us up and amazingly we got through to the end. The last thing I should say there are, even if you think in training I'm not going to need glucose gels, I would practice in training making sure that how you feel when you have a glucose gel. A glucose gel with caffeine can be just the ticket to get you across the line when you're at that last 10, 20 Ks. And have those as emergencies. I've had them in emergencies every course trek I've done and I've always used at least one. So it's a really good way just to give you that final lift when you're into the final, final stages of the event. The last thing to think about then is your hydration. And what I recommend is that you fill your camelback with water so that you've always got water to drink and you sip on that regularly. And then you have a 600 ml bottle that you carry in the side of your pack and you use that with your hydrolyte. In case of a hot day, I would be having at least six little hydrolyte packets in your pack and replenish that bottle all the time so that you make sure that you're drinking the hydrolyte as well as a mixture of the water. When it's on event day, it's really important that you keep looking and watching all your team members. So I recommend staying together. You know, I've seen teams where two are going ahead because they're quicker and there's someone lagging behind. If you let that happen, you can't be keeping an eye on each other. And, you, and it is highly likely that at some point someone is going to hit the wall if they haven't got their nutrition or their hydration right. Now, what to watch out for is if someone is lagging behind, if they're unable to keep up, if they go very quiet and they're not talking to you, you might even get to the point, it hasn't happened in any of my teams, but it did happen to one of my team members when she did it the year before. Her team member members noticed that she was slurring her words, that she was suddenly a bit unsteady on her feet, 
and they recognized it straight away, got her to sit down, and what was happened was her blood sugar levels had really dropped, she hadn't been managing to eat enough, and she was hitting the wall, quite literally hitting the wall, which means your glycogen stores are, are bottomed out and you just haven't got any carbohydrate there. So what to remember is you cannot run on fuel alone, so if that happens to you, you must get carbohydrate. So if you notice that happening to one of your team members, you want an immediate source, a glucose gel is great, get some um, a sports drink or get some of the hydrolyte, there is a little bit of carbohydrate in that hydrolyte, get that into them, get the meeting again as soon as, as possible. So if you've got glucose, little tablets, something like that so that you get an instant energy hit and then they need to eat something much more substantial and for the rest of the event, you have to get the meeting at least every half hour, if not every quarter of hour, because their body's replenishment is gone, so you need to make sure there's enough coming in through the mouth. to be spending time in your shoes and on your feet to give yourself the best chance of not getting an overuse injury and not having blisters. Your feet need time to adapt as you train and you need to spend time identifying whether you're going to develop an overuse injury or whether you have a, a risk of developing blisters. You really should be getting your footwear sorted out well before the 12 to a week mark. You definitely don't want to be getting new shoes for event day or soon before event day uh, because you're going to end up putting yourself at risk of overuse injury and, uh, and blisters. Shoe selection, fit, lacing, really important things that you need to get right from the beginning. Also, you need to have a second, second pair of shoes um, to use on event day and in your training. Really important to use it in your training. Last year in Coast Trek, it was, it was um, a fine day, um, and I think a lot of people would use the same pair of shoes. The year before, it was wet, and uh, most people were changing their shoes because they were getting wet, they were full of sand, and when you've got a wet, sandy shoe, you're at high risk of blisters. So, I highly recommend a second pair of shoes. The type of footwear that you should choose for Coast Trek um, should, should be suitable for trail running, trail walking. Um, it should be cushioned, should be stable, it should have a good grip and um, it should, really importantly, should be comfortable at initial fit. If a shoe isn't comfortable at initial fit, it's bound, you're bound to have problems. Moisture wicking socks uh, are essential to be worn. Uh, you can have wool, merino wool, or you can have uh, synthetic, um, high-tech synthetics which work quite well as well. Just depends on your, your skin type as to which one you prefer. Moisture wicking socks are really important as they, as they draw the moisture away from the, the foot, the skin of the foot, and you're far less likely to get blisters uh, if you're wearing socks like that. Multiple pairs of socks in your bag is essential on event day and in your training. If you're, if you're wearing uh, foot orthotics, for your training for Coast Trek and on event day, you, you really want to make sure they're in the best possible condition and that they're perfect for your foot mechanics. Things change over years. We recommend that people have new orthotics every three to five years, um, particularly if they're getting any new injuries um, or if the orthotic is particularly, particularly worn. So um, definitely, if you're wearing foot orthotics for Coast Trek or planning to wear foot orthotics for Coast Trek, you need to get them checked early on as it takes time for the assessments and for the orthotics to be remade if necessary. You're going to have to choose early on whether you're going to choose foot lubricants or blister prevention taping techniques to avoid hot spots and blisters. 
So a hot spot is an area of skin within the shoe that's under too much pressure or friction, uh, which needs to have time to either, either get used to that level of pressure and friction or you need to arrange a blister prevention strategy like foot lubrication or uh, blister prevention taping. If you're going to be taping your feet, you need to be putting it on the night before. We tend to use a very thin tape um, such as Fixamol or Strap It Fix It. Uh, what that means is that it, it isn't going to take room in your shoes and it's going to uh, allow your foot to move normally but reduce those hot spots. Lubricant as a blister prevention strategy can be really good for some people and it can not work for others. So the best thing for you to do is to, is to work out early on in your training whether foot lubricants are going to work for you. And if they, if they do, that's fantastic. If they don't, stick to taping. Foot care and footwear is really important during Coast Trek event because uh, you want to finish the event, you want to have fun during the event and um, the last thing we want to do is we, we don't want to be seeing people in pain. So do your training, have a good time. because often that's the first thing that people think is, I've got to do this 50 k's, right? And, and so I have to get up and, and build up to 50 k. Now, in fact, um, within your, you, there is a Coast Trek training manual, um, which is absolutely fantastic. And Alicia and the team put it together. And if you download that, and um, there's dates in it about how many, like, in this week, starting this week, aim for about 10 k's. And then two weeks later, the long walk becomes 12 and a half k's. And then two weeks later, it becomes 15 k's. So in fact, all you need to think about is all I need to do every two, and a half, two weeks between now and 4th of March is increase by two and a half k's. So in a, a week, what you'll see from this um, trog, glog, is um, that you've got basically a walk once a week that you're doing, say this was what we did. The interval and the strength part of it is incredibly important. So the whole thing around um, stairs um, and, and little kind of bits of huff and puff, um, getting that strength underneath just walking is incredibly, incredibly important. So that interval and strength planning is very important. Then you might do another walk. So say it's Monday. Monday might be your walk, um, not too long, um, say 40 minutes, something like that, 45 minutes, your interval and strength planning, another walk. Then what I call your reboot day. So your reboot day is a day where you do your low level stuff. And we'll talk about what that looks like. But it's really about getting your brain and your body so that your deep core is really working, that your glutes are working, that, that all the stuff that can lead to injury is really fired on. And then you have another interval strength training day and then you do your distance walk on whichever day you decide it's going to be. So it might, for us it was always a Saturday or a Sunday. 
The big mistake that we see when we see people injured, and we have a lot of people who come through the practice who start endurance walking or a trek or you know, going on Mont Blanc or, or whatever it is, is that they always focus on the distance aspect. And actually, you've got to really get it out of your head that that's the most important thing. It's actually the journey that leads to you being able to do the distance. Um, it's the reboot part of it that I think is actually really, really important. And the reason that that reboot is important is because what we often see is people get globally stronger, so they're getting stronger through their legs, they're getting stronger through their arms, um, but it's often um, your old niggly injuries that really start to play up, and that's really where we where we need to start. So it's not the whole process is not a straight line. You know, your journey is going to look a lot more like this when you start off with one week and you go up, and then you have to have that little bit of downtime sometime in the week, which allows you then to go to the next point, and then the next week, and the next week, and as you gradually progress up you'll find you get to that point about three weeks out where you actually start to taper off. Um, and I've spent many years working with elite athletes, particularly with the Waratahs and the Brumbies, who are now so fabulous. Um, and we were in the dark for so many years. Um, and with netballers, and I think this understanding um, that you do need to taper off, and that's all in your, in your log. So the second tip is that you need to understand what that reboot is for your body type. And that is very much about what we call floppies, flippies and stiffies. This is all about how much flexibility your body has. So the thing with floppies is that they're people who, as kids, you could do the splits. As kids, you could pull your thumb all the way back. You've probably got double jointed elbows. You can still put your hands flat on the floor when you're bending forward. Put your hands up. Who are the floppies? Come on, up you go. There you go, have a look around the room. There's usually about 10 to 12% of the population of floppies. Um, and you'll tend to find with floppies is that because you're very flexible, um, they love stretching, right? But in fact, what floppies need, as floppies start to endurance stuff, because we move a lot, we often end up with a lot more injuries. So if you are a floppy, we need to kind of think about what you're going to do. Stiffies are people who have never, ever touched their toes. They hate stretching more than life itself. They can still remember those dreadful people at school who could do gymnastics and they hated all those classes. They generally don't get very many injuries though. Hands up, who are the stiffies? Put your hands up. See, they're very proud, stiff and proud. Out you go. Um, and the good thing about being a stiffy is you'll probably get through this with absolutely no problem. The majority of us are what we call flippies, floppies with stiff bits, right? So we couldn't quite do the splits as kids. You can touch your toes, but you've always had a bit of a stiff thoracic spine and tight hamstrings, maybe slightly tight hips. Who are, who are they? Generally, have a look around. About 80% of us are, are flippies. And the thing with flippies, we need a bit of a combination to our men. A little bit of stretching, a little bit of stability. So the more floppy you are, the more, you, more likely you are to get overuse injuries as you start to do endurance events. The stiffer you are, the more you have to work on your um, flexibility. So the third thing is this, that the secret to life is in your bum, right? And when it comes to endurance training, it's all about your glutes, right? It's time on your feet and how strong you can get what's called your lumbo-pelvic stability. So the thing is that if you think about walking, and Lisa was saying about her pole, the poles are fantastic, particularly if you're a floppy. Poles give you an incredible amount of, floppies and flippies should use poles, absolutely. Because what they do is they bring your upper body in as you walk and really help turn on your glutes and your um, lumbopelvic stabilizers. So you want to really think about getting poles. And if you've never used them before, book in for a trek training session or come and see us and get someone to show you how to use them because it's actually quite, quite a technique to using poles well. And when you get the hang of it, they're fantastic. But if you look at her there walking through the thing, the big thing you'll see with a lot of us, particularly floppies and flippies, is this tendency that as you're walking for that knee to come in, um, and you'll find that as you get more and more fatigued, this is where if you haven't got good glute control, you'll start to get some injuries coming in there, particularly around your knee. 
So what you'll also see is you'll see a lot of people who take off without their poles and they start doing a lot of very quick walking because they think, well, you know, I'm going to walk quickly and build up my half and puff. But what you often find is that they start to get problems in their feet, particularly in their plantar fascia, and also um, tendinopathy. So that's the kind of thing that you see, Achilles tendinitis, plantar fasciitis, and uh, hamstring problems. So one of the ways to really avoid that, and this is the beautiful Tom Carter who was uh, in the Waratah for many years, um, but basically an exercise like this, which is just a really simple lunge, is a fantastic way to um, really start building up your control for walking because as you can see that if we if we sped that up it would look like walking and what you see is that um, it's that ability to turn on your glute and to turn off your hamstring and calf when you're doing that that is really really important and this is where you really need someone to show you um, how you're doing your lunges how you're doing your squats to really build up your endurance because if you don't, what starts happening is that you start compensating with your back instead of your bum. So what happens when you're walking, you often start to see people starting to get back pain um, because their glutes aren't kicking in. The next one that we see <laughs> is going upstairs. I googled going upstairs and this is what I got. Seriously, just beautiful, isn't it? Um, but what I wanted to show you is how his hamstring's not working. Um, because what's actually happening there is because his buttocks are a little bit on the floppy side, he's actually using his hamstring to get up there. I'll change it over now. Because what we actually want is as, as you're starting to do stairs, and both, both treks have got quite a lot of stairs. So you've got to, you know, th there's being able to get stronger in the way that you, you, the, you're doing your stairs makes such a difference. Um, because as you go up, you won't be daunted when you're looking at that last hill coming into um, St. Balmoral, where there's that big sort of long flight of stairs up from George's Point, and you're just going to go, this is fine, because you've got something in your thing. And this is what you'll see is that when you don't have that good strength, often what will happen then is you start to use your hip flexors, so you'll often get people with um, hip flexor pain and um, osteitis pubis, which is um, uh, groin problems. Um, and you'll often see as well that you'll get back pain as that comes in as well. So you'll get a lot of back pain and tension, you'll get a lot of overarching and gripping because you're trying to compensate through your feet, and you'll also get a lot of hip flexor issues. So, you know, often um, when you do start to get overuse injuries as you increase your load, just be very aware that that's the end of the story, not the beginning of the story. Where you start to get pain is where it's finally the, the, the break in the chain. Right? And actually we need to come right back from that and go, okay, what's your body like? Are you a floppy or a floppy or flippy? Um, have you just suddenly started to increase your load? You know, the number of people we see who are floppies, they've had some, you know, grumpy old in the injury and the first walk they do is 15 Ks. And you go, really? Like, you know, this is what's going to happen. So just really understanding how that, that um, load comes along is very important. So. Have a wonderful Coast Street journey. If you feel any kind of anxiety around your body, come and see us and go and see your physio, your osteopath. We're very happy to work in conjunction with people. Download that training manual, it is bloody brilliant. Um, and it will get you through and be organised, slot it into your diary, get your teams together, you'll be absolutely fine and be just a fantastic journey for the world. Thanks for having me. I'm incredibly proud to, to be part of a, a group of people raising money for the Fred Hollows Foundation uh, because of all the many worthy things we could spend our money on and raise money for, I think the Fred Hollows Foundation has got some really special characteristics. I think number one is the fact that it makes people who are needlessly blind see. It's just such an obvious good that enables the individual to get work, to study, to care for their families. It has such an immediate practical benefit to the individual that uh, I think everyone can understand why that's so important. 
The second thing is that the Fred Hollows Foundation trains people in local communities all over the world and in parts of Australia to do the necessary surgery to help people who are blind to see. So it has a community development aspect. And then on top of that, they've also been involved in manufacturing in the nations where they do the helping, the little thing that they put in the eye to help the blind see. So they've managed to reduce the cost as well as empowering people locally with skills in order to make local people see. It, it, to me, it just ticks all the boxes. The other thing that's quite remarkable about uh, walking for the Fred Hollows Foundation as part of Coast Trek is the impact that our relatively small amounts of uh, money that we raise can make. Uh, as an individual, we make a commitment when we walk with Coast Trek to raise $400. And that can support an optometrist to screen people in many countries and identify people who can benefit from the help of the Fred Hollows Foundation. For the whole team, you raise a minimum of 1600 and this can employ a lid surgeon in a country uh, that can help thousands of people to see. So to us in our Western world, relatively small amounts of money that we can raise from our friends and family and various activities can just have the most astonishing impact. Look, every individual and every team is different when it comes to raising money for, for Coast Trek. But I guess my personal <laughs> top tips for raising money is to use the little messages that we get from the Fred Hollows Foundation. Once you sign up, they send you like little templates and I personalise them. Personally, I make them much shorter and I add in some personal feelings and ideas and I mail them, email them regularly to a large cross-section of friends, family and professional colleagues. And I'm totally unembarrassed about doing that. And I'll tell you why. I have found over a number of years being involved with Coast Trek, like, it's like six or seven years for me, that people really respect the Fred Hollows Foundation. They really know about it. They essentially know it makes the blind see. They know that it takes relatively little money to make a huge difference in people's lives who are needlessly blind and they're keen to give if they can. The second thing I've learned is I don't get upset if someone doesn't give to me, even if they're a close friend, because none of us really know what each other are doing when it comes to donations. So let go of all your anxieties and regularly send out those little templates modified uh, to, to make them personal to you and your team. I've also personally got very involved with Facebook and with Twitter. Tweeting is relatively new for me, but I've learnt that you can attach images or documents to the very short message. It's not just a few little words. You can put on pictures and documents as well. And that's another great way to get the word out about you and your team and what you're doing. And I am classically into Facebook. I post I overpost, I'll be honest with you. But I've found people very responsive on Facebook. And of course, as they repost again and again and again, your message goes viral and really gets out there. But to be honest with you, I've relied exclusively on regular targeted emails, doing lots of photos of me and my teammates training all over uh, the trail that we're going to walk and, and, and uh, uploading them onto my uh, website and often sometimes including those pictures in the emails that I send out. And people are so amazed to see us out there walking red faced with walking poles in my case that I think they feel genuinely moved to give money. And, and I haven't found it hard to get more than is required. Uh, you know, people really support Coast Trek and we have quite a high profile now in the media, so people tend to know what it is. So good luck. <laughs>
in ever-changing terrain with a bunch of like-minded people to raise money for a good cause, it causes a, a, a huge buzz uh, and adrenaline rush within your body, but it's a, a kind of a deep spiritual thing as well. I've been involved with Wild Women on Top, the people behind Coast Trek for a long time, and they have enhanced the quality of my life uh, beyond my wildest imagining. You know, this is something you will enjoy and remember for the rest of your life. So get involved in Coast Trek, you won't be sorry. We hope you found this an invaluable resource in your journey to your Coast Trek event day. There's also heaps of other information and resources online on our website, so make sure you send your teammates there to download their training guide and your map books. Wild Women on Top are the event organisers for Coast Trek. We've seen over 10,000 people take part in our walk along the coasts of Australia. We're excited that you've joined our journey as our goal is to get 50,000 women trekking by 2020. It's a big, hairy, audacious goal, but we have an awesome community and a team that are here to help you on your journey and to reach our goal. Thank you for being part of Coast Trek.